Hi Dandelions, welcome to my October book reviews. Um, I'm sorry about the lighting in here, this is as good as it's going to get I'm afraid. When I close the curtains I have no light whatsoever and when I open them I look like a ghost in a wig. So I'm just going to have to persevere and hope that it's not too distracting. I'm going to kick things off with Reveal, A Sacred Manual for Getting Spiritually Naked by Megan Watterson. I read this one a couple of months ago and I really really enjoyed this one. It's a light read, it's quite easy and I don't mean that in a derogatory sense, I just mean that it's um, it's it's put forth in a language which kind of helps you to really turn the page. I got through it in two days, three days, um, so three sittings and it's given uh, from a kind of memoir perspective by Megan Watterson. I'll read you this little bit at the top of the blurb on the back. It says, discover every woman's birthright, access to the transformative force of the divine feminine. And really what I think she's done with this book is she's really put that mission across. She's put that desire for discovery of the divine feminine in a contemporary context across um, through her memoir style. So she does talk about her childhood and her formative years and the various different reasons that she feels she was disconnected from the idea of the divine feminine. So it can get quite profound in that way. But she also talks a lot about the pilgrimages that she went on. For example, she was very interested in the cult of the Black Madonna and she made several pilgrimages in Europe to visit statues of the Black Madonna. I had no idea about the phenomen phenomenon sorry, of the Black Madonna before reading this book. So that was really interesting to me. She also talks about things like the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, she's very interested in Green Tara, in Buddhism, she also talks about several goddesses, one or two goddesses that she's interested in, like Kali for example. So she's really looking at the various different avenues and pathways down which she's gone to access the Divine Feminine, and she's kind of brushed everything over with um, her own kind of memoir angle on things. And I really enjoyed her language, I really enjoyed the way she put things across. She is very sweet, I, she's quite endearing actually. <laughs> She tells a funny story at one point about meeting R. Kelly on a ferry, which is quite funny. And at one point she also admits that the movie Ghost makes her cry and she talked a little bit about how it kind of connects with her idea of spirit, which I found very endearing. But she also talks about uh, a few things that I found really helpful at the time of reading. She talks about divine timing and ego timing and the difference between the two, how ego kind of has like a laminated timetable for everything you're supposed to get done at a certain point, and your soul is busy trying to struggle against the ego and follow divine timing, which I found interesting. I also found it interesting the way she correlates her experiences of sexual abuse um, with the breakdown in our understanding of the divine feminine as a civilization and the takeover of the Abrahamic um, patriarchal religions. I found this kind of thing really interesting, the way she associates her own personal story with the wider um, search for the divine feminine and the way we wish to get back in touch with it. If you're looking for a read that's not too bogged down in um, academia and information, that has kind of a friendly memoir kind of slant to it, but also has enough historical information to keep you interested and get you learning something, I would definitely recommend Reveal by Megan Watterson. I really enjoyed it. Um, the next book I wanted to review for you guys was Standing in the Light, My Life as a Pantheist by Charmanat Russell. A few things I wanted to say about this one. Firstly, it's really beautifully written. It has a very, very slow pace. The narrative is very relaxed. Um, so it's, it's not a book that I read in a hurry, certainly. Again, it has a memoir perspective to it. It comes from a memoir kind of angle, which I know a lot of people weren't expecting. I've read some reviews on this book uh, where it was kind of aired as a subject for disappointment that it had such a memoir feel to it. I actually really enjoyed that about the book. Basically, she splices the history of pantheism and the history of the thinkers of pantheism from the ancient Greeks right up to now with her own personal memoir of identifying as a pantheist and raising her children, changing her jobs, um, being interested in conservation and ecology, that kind of thing. So you really learn a lot about her life and about what's important to her personally. She talks about the death of her father, the family dynamics and how all of that ties in with her feeling uh, of being pantheist. And then she also has these other bits of the chapter which are dedicated to looking into figures like Marcus Aurelius and Spinoza and talking about what they wrote and that is the stuff that's really so great because she's fantastic at writing about historical figures in a way that makes it really colourful and makes them come to life so I hugely enjoyed that. You have to be really interested in nature writing to enjoy this book on any level, I will say that now. She goes off into very long kind of epic um, 
meanderings talking about the nature reserve that she lives on in New Mexico and describing the changing of the colours of the seasons, describing all of the different birds and animals, the way they behave, the way they interact, the way they behave at different times of the season, all this kind of thing. And she's a, a very good nature writer. She's actually um, just in and of itself, this book alone would show her to be a very accomplished nature writer. But if you're not interested in that, if that's kind of not what you've come to the book for, then there are going to be vast reams of it that you're going to be kind of just flicking through. So I wouldn't recommend it if you're not interested in reading that kind of thing. I actually found that it helped me to take the historical information in more just to have a few pages of, of reading about birds and plants and so on and she's she's got a lot of knowledge on ecology and a lot of knowledge on zoology so um the way she writes about it is very beautiful but as i said the pace is slow if you're not interested in kind of long epic paragraphs about nature writing then you're not going to enjoy this book she actually dedicates one whole page to listing all of the different birds in one area at one time or something i mean it literally is just bird species comma bird species comma <laughs> So you kind of have to question why she's done that and if she's kind of done that as a kind of technique to slow the pace and steady the pace. I'm not sure. I enjoyed it, but it's horses for courses, really. If it doesn't flick your switch, you're not going to like it. Um, anything else that I wanted to say about my life as a pantheist? Okay, she's very much a scientific pantheist and she really does come at it from that perspective. She discusses dualistic pantheists and pantheists who also consider themselves to be mystic, uh, mystical, that kind of thing. She talks about religion, she talks about spirituality and about spiritual practice, but she talks about it from an outsider's perspective. Now, she's quite fair, but I do feel that she's also quite condescending at times. Um, there's one page where she actually talks about the problems with dualistic pantheists or spiritual pantheists in the, the ver various different ways that they kind of show cognitive dissonance in the way that they think. And when I read this, I kind of felt quite patronised and talked down to. I felt kind of like it came from a condescending scientific pantheist on high kind of vibe. Um, at the end, she kind of admits that maybe they have something you know, maybe there is more to it than just scientific monistic pantheism. But the way she writes about it doesn't really suggest to me that she does have a great deal of time for any other kind of pantheistic belief. I think she makes it quite clear that she's a scientific pantheist and that anything else is to her slightly questionable. But it's certainly not written in a derogatory tone. It's certainly not written to be combative. It's just something that I would mention because I know a lot of people who are pantheists who watch my channel are also going to have a strong um, spiritual leaning and are probably in the main going to be dualists. So that's something that you might find interesting. Um, it's very inspiring and expansive writing. I was hoping for some thoughts on veganism and vegetarianism, which I didn't get with this book. She doesn't really talk about that at all. That would have been really interesting for me, I think. Um, she talks about uh, the importance of environmentalism and how our selfishness is causing the polar ice caps to melt and so on. So she's very much on that um, side of the line where pantheism and environmentalism share the same space which as I explained in my pantheism series when I first joined YouTube I'm not 100% sure if I'm on board with that myself personally um, but again it was very interesting the way she wrote about it and she certainly spent a lot more time thinking about it than I have and I am coming to the realisation as I get older and as I progress that when pantheists are overtly concerned with environmentalism what they're fundamentally concerned with is balance they're not really concerned with you know knocking buildings down and ensuring that human civilization dis, uh, you know ceases to be they're really interested in balance and I think that's something that uh, Sharman Apt Russell has brought even more to my attention with this book there's a very interesting there's a few interesting parts in here about the Quakers she's actually a member of the Quakers and that's where the term standing in the light comes from it's actually um a Quaker turn of phrase that was really interesting the mixing of scientific pantheism with Quakerism I thought that was really um, intriguing so yeah I would recommend it to you but with those provisos uh, women who run with the wolves contacting the power of the wild woman by Clarissa Pinkola Estes okay this took me ages to read bloody ages to read it it's been hugely recommended to me by very many uh, women in my life who are who I really respect and who every time you know one of them would recommend it to me I would think okay I really really need to get that book and eventually one day my mum got so much so frustrated with me having never read it that she just went to a bookshop picked it up and dropped it off to me and said for god's sake just read it 
So I did, but God, it took me months. The language is extremely dense, extremely poetic. It's very, very rich in symbolism. It's rich in storytelling. She is a Jungian analyst. So she really comes at everything from an archetypal Jungian perspective. When she's breaking down these stories from these ancient traditions, she's looking into folklore, she's telling you fairy tales. She's breaking everything down in terms of archetypal psychology. And what I mean by that is she's taking every facet and every character from each story and she's relating it back to the psyche of the woman. So this can get quite kind of convoluted and quite tangled. It is also very beautiful and very illuminating, but you've really got to have the stomach for it. You've really got to push on because at some points it is a little bit like wading through treacle and it did take me a very long time to finish. I think some people are quite surprised by that uh, coming from me because it does seem like the kind of book that would absolutely be riveting to me and that I wouldn't be able to put down. But actually, I'm, I'm going to admit I found it hard work at times because every page is so dense and so enmeshed in flowery language that it was almost like my mind was a machete that I was taking to a huge thicket. And sometimes, you know, if I'd had a particularly stressful day, um, this book was just always going to be too much for me. However, very beautiful, very uh, soul nourishing, extremely illuminating on so many levels. And I, I really would recommend that um, anybody, particularly if you're female, get your hands on this book. If you are looking to discover the secrets of feeding your creative life, if you are looking to discover how to harness that fire within you, how to make sure that you are walking with spirit, how to contact your wild woman archetype, um, how to understand why you feel tied down, why you feel chained in, why you feel boxed up. Um, I think it's it's got a lot of soul food in it. It's a really beautiful book and a great many women have said that it has changed their lives. So, you know, I definitely think it's worth looking into. My favourite story, for those of you who have read it, was the, the Little Match Girl. Her analysis of the Little Match Girl was incredible and how she kind of tied that into the creative life and she tied that into the idea of giving out too much and not keeping anything for the self. That I found really profound. In fact, I think I might have shed a little tear when I was reading that one. So, yeah, that was really beautiful. I would recommend that one wholeheartedly, but it is it is an experience. You have to put 100% of yourself into it, but you get 100% good nourishing soul food back. There's a couple of other things I wanted to recommend. Um, I don't know if anyone's spotted this yet from watching my channel for a while, but I'm really interested in positive psychology. I use quite a lot of positive psychology modalities and think a lot about various different studies that have been done in positive psychology, and I kind of try to posit some of that forth into um, what I use to help my clients with the difficulties they're going through, and I kind of I use positive psychology and tie it in with tarot and self-development. So I'm always looking for new positive psychology texts that I can kind of use and link in with what I'm doing and what I'm learning. Um, I've had positive psychology for dummies for quite a while because I kind of thought it would just give me an overview of absolutely everything that I might need and that it would be a good resource and I could kind of flick through and get to things easily. It is a bit dog-eared so you can kind of tell to an extent that I've done that but I would say and I don't know how many of you agree with me that the Four Dummies series is actually pretty convoluted, it's unnecessarily complex and it's kind of one of those things that gets you really frustrated. I mean, there seems to be a double contents kind of vibe with um, the Four Dummies series where they'll give you the breakdown at the beginning, but then within the breakdown, there's so much more stuff that isn't even listed in the contents. And before you know it, you've got like 500 post-it notes in the books. And I just find them very frustrating. I don't know if it's the same for anyone else, but I did want to recommend Positive Psychology in a Nutshell, The Science of Happiness by Ilona Bonniewell. Um, I've gone through this book for the second time now, I'm rereading it, and I just think it gives a fantastic overview. I think it's really clear and simplistic, um, she references all of the sources, she talks about various different studies that have been done, and she talks about all of the main important things that you would need to know to get some kind of structured foundation for the understanding of positive psychology. Um, positive psychology, just to break it down really simply for you, is the notion that psychology should be used in order for us to live well and feel 
feel better, not just in order to um, heal some kind of uh, psychosis or um, right some kind of wrong, um, treat mental illness, if you like, but in fact that psychology should and can be used to help those who are mentally well feel mentally better. Um, how can we look at the structure of our lives and seek to improve on it? How can we look at the different... Um, mental techniques that we put in place to ensure that we're remaining optimistic and to ensure that we feel good about where our lives are going. So that's kind of the main premise with positive psychology. A lot of really interesting studies have been done and I just think, you know, it's not that much of a commitment and it's written in a really accessible way. There's some diagrams in there as well so it keeps things kind of light-hearted. If you wanted to get into positive psychology I would recommend this one. And last but not least, I'm rereading the Norse myths and unlike when I read them quite a few years ago now, this time around I'm reading the Penguin book of Norse myths, Gods of the Vikings by Kevin Crossley Holland. I just wanted to recommend this version of the Norse myths for anybody who's thinking of going back to them or reading them for the first time, purely because I think the way he writes is accessible, but also incredibly rich and incredibly poetic, the way a good set of myths should be delivered to you. It's just contemporary enough for you not to get lost in a kind of snowstorm of ridiculous language, um, kind of defunct, obsolete terms and stuff. It's contemporary enough to bypass that, whilst at the same time feeling very magical and very kind of like um, bedtime, kind of exciting, I'm going to dream some really epic shit. Uh, it's, it's kind of, it's poetic and magical, but not to the extent where it's going to give you a complete headache if you're quite a contemporary reader. So yeah, The Penguin Book of Norse Smiths, Kevin Crossley Holland, I would recommend that if you fancy getting down with Loki and uh, Odin and all the other bad boys of Norse mythology. Um, okay, what else can I say? Well, I'll just give you a quick preview of what I'm doing now. Um, I started The Shaman and Ayahuasca this morning, Journeys to Sacred Realms by Don Jose Compos, and so far, so good, absolutely love it. So you can expect a review of that potentially before the end of the year. And I've been shopping recently, so I'll just show you a few of the things I picked up. Uh, Body of Wisdom women's spiritual power and how it serves by Hilary Hart. I wanted to buy this at the same time as Reveal by Megan Watterson, but I didn't have the cash. So I'm really happy to finally have my hands on it because I do want to continue with this kind of divine feminine reading that I'm doing at the moment. I'm finding that to be really helpful. 7,000 Ways to Listen, Staying Close to What is Sacred by Mark Nepo. I'm really excited about that one. Teach Us to Sit Still, A Skeptic Search for Health and Healing by Tim Parks. I'm going to explain a little bit more when I review this one about why I specifically wanted to read um, a book about healing for skeptics. I suppose, you know, with my chronic pain and so on, being that I'm intensely spiritual and I'm a pagan witch, you wouldn't expect me to label myself as a skeptic when it comes to complementary medicine, um, mind over matter, that kind of thing, using your mind to heal you. But I would say that I am very much a skeptic in a few ways. So I will explain <laughs> at the time of reviewing why I've chosen such a book and what I thought of it. I've also purchased Bronnie Ware's book, The Top 5 Regrets of the Dying. Uh, this was originally a blog post which ended up getting 3 million hits and then she ended up writing a book about her experiences in palliative care and her experiences talking to people who were dying about their regrets and about how they felt about their lives. So this one's going to be heavy reading I think but um, it just kept drawing me to it. It's been there for quite a while now just kind of winking at me and staring at me and eventually I thought you know what I have to read that book. So I will let you know how I get on with these and let me know if you have any recommendations for me. Much love, blessed be.